previously, we started to look at the uh, components of psychophysical experiments, and we also um, went over the type of frequently used stimuli in psychophysics, such as sine wave gratings and optotypes. So, what do we measure with those stimuli in psychophysics uh, will be uh, the topic of this week's lecture. So, there are a number of different measurements in psychophysics, such as percent correct performance of a certain visual task, or rating, and so on, but in many visual psychophysical tests, a threshold of a certain aspect of vision, such as contrast or size, is probably the most frequently measured um, quantity. And the threshold uh, is used to be defined as the absolute minimum, so the weakest uh, stimulus strength or intensity that results in the change of perception. But then later, this definition of a sensory threshold has been expanded to mean the strength of signal that is required to attain a specific level of task performance. Uh, for example, like 75% correct, uh, correct performance level or the 90% 90, uh, 90 and so on. So in fact, uh, it is difficult to discuss about threshold alone without talking about uh, other components of psychophysical experiments, such as psychophysical task. So here the um, psychophysical task is what the observer needs to do in an experiment that is designed to measure the threshold underlying the perceptual process of interest. So let's take a look at the uh, sample of psychophysical experiment to talk about the arrest of the uh, components. As you probably know better than me, um, subjective refraction is one of the routine uh, examination performed by eye care professionals like you to determine the optimal lenses that will provide the patient with the best corrected visual acuity. Um, the entire steps involved in the subjective refraction are based on many psychophysical techniques and principles. So, before you refract the patient in the um, subjective refraction, you first need to determine the patient's best uncorrected visual acuity using the acuity chart. In this case, uh, the stimulus of choice is uh, optotype. And in that task, what you are measuring is called a recognition or identification threshold, where the patient's job or task is to correctly identify or recognize the letter presented to the patient. So the aspect of vision being tested in this case is the size of the letter, right? The size of the stimulus, basically, the visual stimulus, and that's what's changing during the process. So what we are measuring here is the uh, what's called absolute threshold. In other words, the smallest letter size the patient can correctly identify. And next, um, the name of the uh, procedure measuring the uh, threshold is called the forced choice procedure. So in this procedure, uh, the observer or patient is presented with a number of alternatives in the visual stimulus. So when there are only two alternatives to choose from, then this is called a two-alternative forced choice procedure, which is probably the simplest and the most common form of forced choice procedure used in psychophysical experiments. Technically speaking, um, the procedure used here is considered as a um, 10 alternative fourth choice procedure because 10 letters are used in the QD chart, even though the patients are not usually aware of this. So this procedure is considered objective 
in that patient's response can be verified with correct answer. So in this procedure, target stimulus is always presented so the choice between the alternative responses are uh, supposedly on an equal footing, which is a good thing because it reduces criteria fluctuation due to the uncertainty by forcing the patients um, to use their best guesses. And of course, the patient will make lucky guesses sometimes, uh, but unlucky guesses as well, so they will cancel each other out in the long run, assuming that the alternatives are presented at random and in no predictable pattern. Now, the psychophysical method running the experiment is called method of limits, which is one of the classical psychophysical methods established by Lechner. So here, uh, we will take a bit of a detour to look at different psychophysical methods in more detail. And we will consider method and analysis together because adopting a specific method will determine how the collected data will be converted into threshold measurements. So here the analysis uh, concerns how threshold is calculated at the end of each method. The classical psychophysical methods to measure thresholds as we know of today are pretty much established by Gustav Fechner. So he developed three different methods to measure psychophysical thresholds, namely method of limits, adjustment, and constant stimuli. Uh, in this module, I will only focus on the first two classical methods in more detail, uh, as they are more relevant to the field of eye care. In fact, um, the last method of constant stimuli is not very frequently used these days um, anyways. And later on, I will cover staircases in detail and briefly touch upon the other advanced and efficient techniques that have been developed recently. So before we take a look at these methods, um, there are two terms used in psychophysical experiment um, that I want you to distinguish because you will write a report including those words after running a canned psychophysical experiment in next trimester. Uh, previously, I read students' paper and realized that students don't really know the difference between these two. So in psychophysical literature, the word trial means a single presentation of a stimulus, whereas a session is a series or a block of trials. So for example, if you presented an optotype, um, the letter say O to the patient's right eye, and she or he reported, then a trial is completed, okay? And then you continue the presentation until you determine the best uh, corrected or uncorrected visual acuity in the patient's right eye, then a session is completed. Now you can run another session of trials to measure the best uh, uh, visual acuity in the same patient's left eye. Well, I hope uh, you know this kind of makes sense. So, and then um, you know the difference between the trial and the session. Um, so, in general, an absolute threshold is defined as the minimum intensity, uh, strength, or magnitude of any aspect of visual stimulus that the observer can just barely detect or identify against the null. So if the stimulus intensity is less than the subject's absolute threshold, then the stimulus will not be detected or not identified, not until when the stimulus intensity goes over the threshold of uh, the subject. So in the example of the subjective refraction, the stimulus intensity of interest uh, is the size of the letter, um, you know, in, in the steps determining the best uncorrected visual acuity. And the patient uh, will not be able to recognize any letter if the letter size goes below his or her 
threshold letter size. And here are the uh, generalized steps to measure absolute thresholds using the method of limits. And so depending upon the direction of stimulus intensity change, method of limits can be either descending or ascending. In a descending series of method of limits, um, the experiment begins with the presenting a stimulus with high enough intensity so that most people can detect or identify it. In an ascending series, on the other hand, the first trial starts with a stimulus intensity so low that is expected to be unrecognizable or undetectable by most people. And depending upon the response of the observer, the intensity of the stimulus in the next trial will either decrease or increase. You repeat the same procedure until the observer's direction of response changes, and then the session is terminated. So only the last two intensities are used for the final analysis of the observer's threshold, which will be the average intensity between the two intensities presented at the last and the second last trials. Um, here the idea is that the threshold is um, supposedly located somewhere in between the two in intensities where the observer's perceptual response switches. So the uh, visual acuity measurement is an example of a descending series method of limits where the uh, measurement starts with the large enough optotype uh, assumed to be recognized by most people, say 6 over 60, right? So the top of the line is a 660 and for people with normal vision they won't have problem um you know reading the entire line then you're going down the chart uh, where the size of letter uh, progressively decreases until the patient cannot read so unlike the uh, typical threshold and uh, threshold analysis used in general method of limits the final threshold i.e the best uncorrected visual acuity is considered to be the smallest red line. Now that we determine the patient's best uncorrected visual acuity, we will run the uh, subjective, uh, subjective refraction using the same stimulus. And in the process of um, subjective refraction, what you are measuring this time is the difference threshold where you ask the patient if she or he sees the difference in clarity with or without the added power of the lens you present. More generally, um, the difference threshold is defined as minimal intensity difference between a pair of stimuli that is noticeable to the observer, uh, which is also known as just noticeable difference or JND for short or difference limit. So if the intensity difference between the pair of stimuli is below the difference threshold of the subject, then the difference is undete undetectable. On the other hand, uh, if the intensity difference between the pair of the stimuli is above uh, the difference threshold, then the, uh, the difference is detectable. In, um, detectable. And in this process, one of the pair is called a standard or reference stimulus, and the other stimulus in the pair is called a comparison or test stimulus. Now the patient is faced with the two choices, whether the letter uh, looks clearer or not. Uh, even though patient is um, forced to choose one of two alternatives, uh, this procedure is different from the two alternative force choice procedure in that you cannot verify if the patient's response is systematic or random, hence the name subjective refraction. Now, the psychophysical method measuring the difference threshold is still the method of limits where you zone in on the optimal 
refractive power needed for the patient. Well, I apologize if I just scared you, um, but if you just turn the volume down as instructed to the level comfortable to your, to your ear, instead of turning it completely off, then you just apply the descending series method of adjustment, which is another way to collect the data and measure threshold. Unlike the um, other methods where stimulus intensity is controlled by the experimenter, uh, in this method, uh, the observer has control over the stimulus intensity to measure his or her own threshold, except for the uh, initial intensity, which is set to be far from the expected threshold value by the experimenter. Um, in this method, the observer is instructed to adjust the uh, intensity uh, by a physical or software device such as knob or slider until it is just uh, just detectable or just undetectable. Again, the intensity of a stimulus can be ascending or descending and threshold can be determined very quickly but not very precise, uh, precisely with this method. So, um, Therefore, this is uh, rarely used in any serious psychophysical experiment these days, except for the pilot experiment, where you try to quickly determine a rough range of stimulus intensities to use in future studies. So far, we have looked at the uh, two classical psychophysical methods to measure threshold, and Let's um, talk about you know, some of the issues with these methods. Uh, with both method of limits and adjustment, you can determine thresholds relatively quickly, so it has obvious clinical advantages. However, uh, they're not really used in uh, more serious psychophysical experiments because of some critical disadvantages. First, uh, both methods are subject to the habituation, uh, which is the uh, tendency to repeat the same response even after the sensation has actually changed. So this tendency effectively increases the threshold in an ascending series and it will decrease the threshold in a descending series. Since the, um, the stimulus intensity change is one direction in both series, some sort of you know, perceptual momentum is created after a number of trials. So you have this uh, kind of a psychological inertia to keep it, keep it going further than you should. Uh, another problem in these methods is expectation. Again, because of this uh, unidirectional change of stimulus intensity, you'll be aware when you are close to your own threshold if you're keen. So when the threshold approaches, then you sort of prepare yourself to change your uh, response but ended up changing it earlier than you should. So this will have an opposite effect to habituation, where the, um, the threshold will be increased in a descending series, uh, whereas the threshold decreases in, a, a, in an ascending series. Finally, um, there is an issue of what initial value should be uh, chosen. So if the initial value is too far from the threshold, then obviously it'll take longer to get to the threshold and you will have more chance, um, no, uh, that the observer will have more chance to habituate. For example, when you refract a patient, uh, the lower the patient's visual acuity, then the more the spherical power needed to elicit apparent change in clarity or blur for the patient, which in turn takes longer to refract. Uh, on the other hand, if the initial stimulus intensity is too close to threshold, uh, 
then the subject might be confused and the response will fluctuate instead of converging onto the precise threshold estimation. So to make up for these methodological shortcomings, it is recommended to repeat both ascending and descending series multiple times and take the average across the thresholds for final estimation because each series may yield different results to results no matter how slightly so. And even the results from the same series are quite variable too. So um, it is always good to run uh, you know, each series multiple times and have an average threshold estimation. Since Fechner, uh, psychophysical methods have been drastically improved to measure thresholds in terms of time and precision uh, of the final threshold estimation. In general, you want to consider modifying one or more of the following aspects of psychophysical methods if you're thinking about developing a new one. So the first aspect to consider is the stimulus placement in each trial, uh, which concerns how to present stimuli in order to obtain the most information about the parameter of interest, which is threshold, basically. Well, it is not true. Uh, depending upon the psychophysical method, uh, there are other parameters you want to actually measure, such as slope of the uh, psychometric function that we will discuss later in more detail. Um, and also, you want to actually uh, uh, gain this uh, most information with the least amount of effort. So, for that matter, strategical and economical stimulus placement is a key to increase the efficiency of any psychophysical method in general. So, for the uh, optimal stimulus placement, um, uh, you need to determine the uh, the level of the initial stimulus intensity for the first trial, which is a very important um, so, uh, so that you know your method don't get astray and lost in finding uh, the threshold. In fact, uh, this is probably the most difficult aspect to improve on for any psychophysical method. And another aspect of stimulus placement you need to consider is the stimulus intensity for the next trial, which typically changes according to the subject's response to the stimulus intensity presented in the previous trial. So as an example from measuring visual acuity, you will decrease the letter size by going down the chart after patient um, correctly identifies all five letters on a given line. However, you can change this rule uh, about you know, when to change the stimulus intensity, meaning, for example, you may only need a couple of correct responses from the patient instead of all five to decrease the letter size when you are certain that the letter size seems big enough so it is just too easy for the patient. And another aspect of stimulus enhancement, step size, between the trials is um, very important. So here the step size refers to the difference in stimulus intensity between any two consecutive trials, which will be closely related to the final threshold calculation as well as testing time. So if the step size is too jumpy, right, then the method will quickly approach to the threshold zone, but the threshold estimation will be coarse. If the step size is too fine, then it'll take much longer to estimate threshold. And the threshold estimation, uh, threshold calculation is another crucial part of a psychophysical method. In the end, um, that is the ultimate goal of any psychophysical testing. So, um, Obtaining an unbiased and precise threshold estimate at the end of a testing is very important. Finally, um, the termination rule is closely related to the previous two rules. For example, you want to make sure if the threshold um, obtained after a certain number of trials is accurate and precise. So generally, your estimation will get better with more data 
in terms of precision and accuracy, but you have to end the experiment at some point before the observer gets too tired, especially um, you know, the patient or the observers get um, quickly tired in the psychophysical testing because it is very uh, boring and monotonic. Having considered those aspects to improve in psychophysical methods, um, one of the earlier modified methods from the classical methods to introduce here is called the staircase method, where both ascending and descending series methods of limits are combined in a single session. So to give you a better idea to illustrate how staircase works, here we have a volunteer subject drafted for this boring psychophysical test, seated comfortably on a chin rest in a dark testing room, looking attentively at the black screen on the top right corner. So in this testing, he is expecting to see a dot in the middle of the screen in each trial, and his job is to report if he indeed see the spot of light when it's on by pressing Y, for yes, and when he thinks he did, pressing no for no when he thinks he did not. So in each trial, the brightness of the dot will change according to the rule of the staircase, uh, where the brightness will go down when he says yes, go up when he says no. And the, um, the graph uh, on the right bottom corner will show you the trial by trial progression of the stimulus intensity changes according to the subject's response. So here the x-axis is the trial number from 1 to n, and the y-axis is the brightness of the dot presented in each trial. So in a typical psychophysical experiment for light detection, um, you will see a message like this, click to start, then our psychophysical observer will press, say, like a, a space bar, to start. So in the first trial, um, the brightest dot is presented on the screen. So obviously this is bright enough for the subject to detect, so he say yes for that intensity. So this plus sign is um, you know, representing yes response, and the minus will represent no response. So for the first trial, he said yes. So um, see that is um, the subject response at this slide intensity and at the first trial. So this is how you read this graph. Okay, so his first response was yes to that light intensity, right, the brightness. So we move on to the next trial. So because he said yes, the brightness of the light actually slightly decreased from the previous one. But this is still bright, uh, bright enough for the subject, so he says yes again, right? And then because he said yes, it'll go down again in the next trial. But he can still see it. So he keeps saying yes until this brightness. So it's just let's pretend that he wasn't able to see it, right? Even though we can see it. But in the real psychophysical experiment, um, the brightness of the dot will be uh, very finely calibrated and then it'll approach. So even though it is on, but um, there will be a time that you cannot detect um, the dot in the middle of the screen. Anyhow, so let's just pretend that he didn't see this. So he said no, right? So up until now, this is actually the descending series of uh, the, the descending series method of limits, right? So now from this light intensity, because he says no, uh, the rule of the staircase is that um, the stimulus intensity will increase after 
a single no response. So in the next trial, the dot intensity. So this is the you know first reversal. Uh, that's what they call because from this intensity, the stimulus intensity changes in the opposite direction. So it'll increase. So it has been going down, right? But because of the subject response, now it'll go up, right? So it went up, and he said no to this stimulus brightness. So he, he wasn't able to see it, right? Okay, so then you just keep increasing the light intensity until he sees it, right? So this is another reversal point where the stimulus intensity, uh, the, the direction of the stimulus intensity presentation will change in the opposite direction again. So he changes his response. So now the next trial. And he said yes, even though we increased the stimulus intensity from the previous trial. Uh, did I say increase? The decrease, right? Even though we decreased the stimulus, the, the brightness from the previous trial. So we decrease further, and then he cannot, he cannot see it. So from this point on, we're going to increase uh, the brightness. I can't see it. Can't see it. And now he uh, saw it. So now this um, is uh, basically ascending series method of limits. And then it's descending again, ascending again, right? So we can see that in staircase, both ascending and descending series are combined together, right? And it changes according to the subject's response. And we just keep doing this. So that's another reversal point. Okay, so that's the end of um, the testing. So session has ended. So how many trials have we had? Um, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, seventeen. So the total number of trials used in this session was n equals seventeen. So that was the, the total number of trials used. Now, um, over the seventeen trials. There were four reversals occurred uh, in a session, right? One, two, three, four. So the final analysis um, to estimate the threshold is to take the average light intensities where reversal occurred. Well, here the note says that the threshold estimate is the mean of the last M reversals. Uh, that's because typically when you have, um, you know, more reversals than this, like, a, you know, 10 reversals, that is kind of a typical number of reversals you're going to, um, that's going to occur in a session of staircase. So because the first couple of reversals are actually quite variable, so it is kind of a, um, you know, standard procedure to discard the first few uh, reversals and just take the take only the last uh, m number of reversals. Okay, so that is kind of a standard procedure. So I hope that you now understand how the staircase works. Um, now let's think back. You know what happened in the previous session by considering the components of a psychophysical experiment such as stimulus, measure, task, procedure, and so on. So here the uh, stimulus used is a dot, right? And what was measured in the experiment was threshold. And more specifically, it was the detection threshold, which represents uh, the minimum brightness of the dot the subject can see. So the detection is the task that the subject needed to carry on in the experiment. And for that task, a uh, yes-no procedure was used. And as I said before, this is a subjective procedure because we cannot verify his answers. Uh, 
We can only trust he is serious about the experiment and generating the genuine responses to the brightness of the dot. But even then, um, you know, this procedure can still be problematic because the subject's responses can be uh, criterion dependent and prone to bias. So, for example, if the uh, subject is more concerned about missing the target, then um, the subject will be prone to say yes more than necessary. On the other hand, if the, uh, if the subject is more concerned with false alarm or finger errors, then the subject will become more conservative to say yes. So whenever possible, it is always better to use force choice procedure uh, where the subject's response can be verified. And the method used here is the staircase method. And the rule of the staircase here was one down, one up, um, where the stimulus intensity will decrease after the positive response, whereas the stimulus intensity will go up with the negative response. So the, the staircase used here is, uh, is usually called one-to-one -one staircase, including the rule of the staircase. And finally, the analysis of threshold is performed by averaging the last m number of reversals, to provide the final estimate of threshold with precision statistics. But in practice, um, the variability of the threshold estimate is not typically reported. Um, and I don't know the exact reason why it is not reported. So let's look at the staircase method in more detail with respect to the different aspects of psychophysical method that we have talked about previously. So first, um, stimulus placement. Um, the initial stimulus intensity for the first trial is usually well below or above the expected range of threshold, which is the same as the classical method of limits or adjustment. Well, in fact, um, this is a pretty much a guesswork and there is no set rule to determine the specific level of initial stimulus intensity. But there is a specific rule how the intensity changes in the following trials, uh, which is, um, in this case, one-to-one -one rule. And the intensity changes in relation to the subject's response to the previous intensity. So then how much should you change in intensity between the trials? But that is the, uh, the question of the step size. And in many cases, Intensity changes are made in log scale, as it is known that many perceptual changes seem to be uh, better represented in log scale than linear scale. An octave is a special name for the log scale with a base of two, uh, which is uh, frequently used in um, the auditory perception. And Less frequently, uh, a percent difference uh, step size is also used. For example, if the initial brightness was 100% and the response to the brightness was positive, then the next brightness will be decreased to 90%. So the step size used here is 10%. Um, it is a common practice to use multiple step sizes to increase the precision of the final threshold estimation. For example, you start your staircase with a larger step size first to get to the threshold zone quickly, and then reduce the step size after a certain number of trials or reversals for finer convergence to the threshold. And in fact, this is what you do in subjective refraction too, uh, where you start with a half a diopter lens and then reduce the power of the lens to quarter of a diopter when you think you're close to uh, the, uh, the threshold of the patient. And also, um, the, the step size um, you used in the subjective refraction is also in log scale because you're doubling or halving between the power of the lens. Um, so the termination rule, so that uh, is... Um, that uh, has to do with uh, you know when you need to stop a staircase, right? So first, 
We can terminate a staircase after a certain number of trials, say after 50 trials. Or you can stop a staircase after a certain number of reversals occur, say 10 reversals. Or you can terminate the staircase whichever comes first. Um, so depending upon the rules of the uh, staircase, um, so the 50 trials uh, will take less than like a five minutes to run a session of staircase. But um, say so one to one, one to one staircase is you know, the simplest staircase, and then uh, um, and I'm pretty sure they only um, you know runs about like a couple of minutes. But if you increase the the if you change the rule of the staircase, say to two to one, three to one, four to one, then uh, the amount of time to uh, uh, finish a staircase actually um, uh, gets longer. And in staircase procedure, the final threshold estimation is calculated by averaging the last m reversals, which is less than the total number of reversals. Uh, here the n um, represents the total number of uh, reversals. So um, typically, um, so you you uh, take the average of the last seven or eight reversals uh, when your staircase um, is set to terminate after 10 reversals. And as I said before, that's because uh, the first few reversals are highly variable and they may still be far from the threshold range anyway because that is the kind of a, a initial stage of uh, a staircase converging to the threshold range. In rare cases, uh, the intensity, the stimulus intensity at the last trial is reported as a final threshold estimate, but that is not very common and that is not really recommended. So here we have a typical graph of a staircase uh, showing how the staircase moves along the trial. Um, so here the y-axis represents the stimulus intensity in decibel unit, which is another log scale with a base of 10 uh, presented in each trial. So the staircase starts with the descending series with the large step size of five decibels. See, and it starts with uh, about like a 13 decibel and it's just a quickly going down. And then if you look at the difference between um, the difference, difference between uh, the any consecutive trials, uh, it, the step size looks like, uh, you know, same with the, uh, the tick marks here, right? The five decibel. So the, the initial step size for this staircase is five decibel. And um, the horizontal line here represents the hypothetical threshold that this staircase is trying to estimate. Um, here, the rule of the staircase is one to one. So the direction of the stimulus intensity changes in a way that every um, negative response increases the stimulus intensity by five decibel of the previous intensity uh, whereas the intensity decreases by five decibel after every positive response until the 14th um, or fourteenth trial or the five reversals so from there on now the step size changes to 2.5 decibel right so this staircase uses two different step sizes and after that point on you can see that the staircase actually hovers around um, quite closely to the threshold until the end of the staircase right um, as you can see uh, the staircase fluctuates a lot more in the initial stage here right then um, the rest of the staircase, which is the reason why people took out the first few reversals from the threshold calculation. Um, now let's just account how many uh, reversals we have uh, in this staircase. So, um, so this is the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
8 and Twenty two, twenty three, twenty three. Right, so we have um twenty three reversals. In this staircase so um in fact with this many reversals i would just uh, check out one two three four five five first uh, reversals uh, to calculate the uh, final threshold so i will just only take the average of last 18 reversals to calculate the uh, final threshold for this staircase so in the staircase with a one-to-one -one rule, um, the positive and negative responses are equally weighted. So technically speaking, the threshold measured using one-to-one -one staircase will converge onto the stimulus intensity at which the subject is completely uncertain about his or her perception, right? Because the subject's response to this stimulus intensity will generate positive and negative responses 50-50. So we can tweak the rule of staircase. So to make the uh, threshold, we are measuring converge onto somewhere less than certain for either positive or uh, positive or negative responses. So here the graph um, shows such an example of staircase called three to one staircase, where the subject has to provide three positive responses in a row for a reduction of stimulus intensity. Whereas only one negative response will increase the stimulus intensity with the same step size in both direction. So here the, uh, the probability for the staircase to change its direction is not equal between the positive and negative responses. In this case, uh, the probability that the intensity goes up is 50% only after a single negative response Whereas the probability of the intensity goes down is the probability of obtaining a three positive responses in a row. So in a three down, one, uh, three down, one up staircase like this, um, uh, the, the, the probability of getting three positive responses in, is, in a row is equated to the 50% chance of getting a negative response. So in theory, three to one staircase converges onto the threshold, yielding more positive responses about 79.4% of the times compared to the negative responses. Um, here, the number of trials used is the same as before, 50 trials, and the y-axis uh, has the same stimulus, stimulus level <coughs> or the intensity uh, in the unit of decibel. But if you um, see uh, the, the shape of the staircase, it's a little bit different. So here the, the black square represents the positive responses. And again, it starts uh, with the descending series uh, of a method of limits. See, the stimulus intensity only goes down after three consecutive positive response by uh, the step size of five decibel right and it is so when you have so for these tr three trials so that the nothing changes in terms of a stimulus intensity right so it just keeps going down until you hit a single negative response right so this is where the first interval occurs. Okay, so this is the stimulus intensity uh, at the uh, first interval. Now, after a single negative response, the staircase goes up again, and then this subject produce a positive response. And then the, in the next one, because it is positive, the stimulus intensity doesn't change. It stays, right, until um, he 
or she gets the uh, three positive responses. So it is uh, the next trial, um, the same stimulus intensity presented to the subject, and then the subject produces negative response. And then after a single negative response, the intensity increases again, right? So it's just, it never changed here. So this is not the reversal point. It just keeps going up until here. And then with, at this stimulus intensity level, this subject got three positive responses in a row. And this is where the staircase, staircase goes down again, right? So this is another reversal point. So this is a second reversal. This is a first reversal. So the stimulus intensity went down, but the subject produced um, the negative response here. So the staircase goes up again. So this is third reversal. It just went up and then got three positive responses in a row. And this is where the fourth reversal occurred. It goes down until the 31st trial, I, th I think. And this is a fifth reversal, six, seven, eight. Okay. So the total number of reversal here is eight, right? So um, this is a bit confusing, but you know, once you get used to it, then um, you should be able to calculate the, uh, the total number of reversal occurred in a modified staircase. And this has been on the exam quite frequently, so uh, you might want to just uh, get used to uh, read this um, staircase graph. So the um, transform staircase has been the popular psychophysical method of choice for a long time to measure threshold, which was um, traditionally considered as all or non-perceptual process that has a fixed and discrete value. So from this perspective, people imagine that perceptual state suddenly changes like a step function at the threshold um, as shown in this picture. So um, here the threshold is at 280, um, you know, whatever the unit is uh, in terms of light intensity. And then the detection rate um, abruptly changes from zero to 100%. So that is the kind of a traditional notion of threshold, uh, which is um, yeah, the definition of the absolute threshold. However, um, uh, researchers soon realized that the threshold varies somewhat from trial to trial and session to session. And the perceptual representation of a stimulus is not constant due to the small additive random errors introduced the visual system called uh, internal noise. So it follows that the function relating the physics of the stimulus to sensation or perception does not look like a step function, but a smooth probabilistic curve monotonically increasing as the stimulus intensity increases like this. Um, so from this continuous curve, an absolute threshold is conventionally defined as the stimulus intensity yielding perceptual experience 50% uh, of the time on the curve when the um, observer's response is binary. So the um, psychometric function uh, is a family of functions relating physical characteristic of stimulus, such as contrast or size, um, to the corresponding sensation. For example, proportion of correct responses or proportion of trials perceived brighter or dimmer in the light detection task. So <clears throat> psychometric function um, describes the uh, probability of an observer's response as a function of the stimulus strength. So here we have kind of a general equation of um, psychometric function, where small p here represents the probability of the subject's response represented by R, given the stimulus intensity, 
uh, S, right? And this Psi, it's a, it's a capital letter of P in Greek. Psi, the psychometric function, has um, four parameters. Oh, sorry. Um, well, four parameters, right? So uh, the, the stimulus here, intensity, is actually the, uh, the outcome measure. And then a psychometric function can be characterized with a threshold location parameter, alpha. Beta is the slope parameter. So how quickly the perception changes as a function of uh, the stimulus strength. And the gamma is the, um, the guess rate. So this guess rate is um, a 0.5 or 50% in case um, of the two alternative force choice task. And lambda is lapse rate. Um, so this actually accounts for some um, you know, finger error, right? So sometimes people just um, you know, make an error even though the stimulus intensity is high enough. Um, so in normal conditions, they will just give 100% correct responses, but sometimes they just miss it uh, because of the blink or uh, because of the, uh, the, the slipping finger or whatever. So this is another equation to um, describe a generic psychometric function. Gamma is the guess rate. And then this um, quantity inside the bracket will determine um, the maximum um, value in the uh, psychometric function considering the lapse rate. And then everything else is determined by the, um, the location parameter and the slope. And this function uh, will be determined by the stimulus strength on the x-axis. And typically, the psychometric function um, looks like a kind of an S-shape, right? And uh, so the, the family of function used to a model the psychometric function is called zygomoidal. So here is some example of um, psychometric function with a different location and the slope parameter. So in fact, um, the cumulative normal distribution uh, is frequently used to model a psychometric function. So um, this is quite um, uh, relatable to the um, the, the, the clinical research method lecture, right? So here on the x-axis, we have stimulus intensity, right, in log scale. And then on the y-axis, we have a proportion of stimulus detected. Um, so this blue curve represents a supplementary function uh, with the location of zero, mean is zero, basically. And the slope or the standard deviation is one. And if you change the location parameter to um, the right side by just one unit, then it, it just changes the location from the blue to the right. And the slope is exactly the same. So they actually look parallel to each other. And we can change the location parameter to the left side by three units. And that is the um, same supplementary function. I mean, you know, with the same slope, but different location. And if you change the uh, slope parameter, so if you have larger standard deviation, uh, the slope of the psychometric function uh, becomes shallower. And this is a, a more standard deviation of the slope parameter. And the absolute threshold is defined on the point of the curve where it yields. So it's a point on the x-axis. So that is the absolute threshold there where it yields the 50% of the response from the subject. Um, so that is the absolute threshold, but um, in general, threshold is just um, defined as um, a stimulus intensity yielding a specific level of performance. So you can cut this psychometric function anywhere you want and 
just to say that you know this is the um, my threshold definition yielding say 60% or 70% performance on the psychometric function curve. So if you're using a fourth choice procedure, then you can plot a psychometric function relating percent correct performance as a function of a stimulus intensity. Here are some hypothetical psychometric functions from two, four, and 10 alternative fourth choice experiment. As you can see, the, uh, the lower asymptotes, which are just the guess rate of the uh, psychometric functions, um, uh, they are just different because of the different number of alternatives used. So for example, the lower asymptote for the um, psychometric function from two alternative force choice experiment in red is actually a 0.5, right, here. Whereas it is 0.1 for the uh, 10 alternative force choice in blue. So in general, a threshold for n number of alternative force choice procedure is usually defined as the stimulus intensity yielding a midway percent correct response between the guessing rate and 100%. So therefore, um, the threshold for two alternative fourth choice experiment is defined at the intensity yielding 75% correct performance level. So these are the uh, different um, the guess rate depending upon the number of alternatives you have. And for the two alternative fourth choice task, um, the threshold is defined um, in, at the, uh, the midway um, yielding 75%, so between the perfect performance and the 50% performance. So the midway percent correct performance is at 75, and the threshold um, at that in a performance level is defined as the threshold. And on the other hand, um, the, uh, the threshold for four AFC, the, the four alternative force choice experiment, is defined at the intensity yielding 62.5%. And it goes, um, it's the same with the, uh, any uh, uh, number of alternative force choice task. Now, people realize that measuring the whole psychometric function is important. But to model a psychometric function, then you need to measure a lot more thresholds than just a single threshold, which will effectively increase the burden of data collection from both experimenter as well as subject's point of view. But this problem can get a lot worse um, when there are multiple levels of variable uh, to be measured. For example, say you want to study the legibility of all 26 alphabets as a function of their size, in measuring VA. By doing so, you want to fully characterize how subject's performance changes with the size of each alphabet by measuring 26 psychometric functions. Assuming that measuring just a single threshold takes 50 trials per alphabet using a staircase, the sheer number of trials to run becomes 1,300 trials altogether just to measure thresholds, right? However, you need to have at least two thresholds to model even a line, and that'll become a perfect line. Now, that'll become 2,600 trials, but practically, you need to have more than uh, two dots to model any line or curve to establish meaningful accuracy and precision. And no one knows how long it'll take to model a psychometric function this way. So, um, there has been a strong demand to develop a new method so that um, psycho a psychometric function can be modeled from the experiments within a reasonable amount of time and effort. So, the, uh, the major improvement of these uh, modern techniques, uh, mostly coming from massive increase in computing power and the clever algorithm for stimulus placement. So thanks to this um, advanced algor algorithm, um, the uh, modern uh, adaptive methods can now measure the underlying psychometric function 
more quickly and efficiently without sacrificing the quality of the measurement. So there are quite a few advanced techniques out there, but I'll introduce you to one of the parametric methods called the Psi method. So this method is based on Bayesian principle to estimate an underlying psychometric function of an observer for any perceptual task. So basically, in every trial, Psi method will estimate the observer's psychometric function based on his previous response to the optimally selected stimulus intensity, which is pre-computed to maximize the information gain about the observer's underlying psychometric function for the uh, next trial. So let's just take a look at the simulation of the method. So what you are seeing here is a simulation of the Psi method uh, trying to estimate an underlying psychometric function of an imaginary observer over 300 trials. So the uh, Psi method can assess both the location and the slope parameter of a psychometric function at the same time in real time based on the uh, Bayesian principles. So even though uh, it's uh, pretty computer intensive, it can be run on any personal computers of today. So here the top left panel shows the uh, trial by trial estimation of the location parameter of the underlying psychometric function uh, with the blue dots. The true location parameter to be estimated is represented by the horizontal line here. Um, so that is the um, the the value, the true value of the location parameter of the underlying psychometric function. And uh, the appearance of alternating green and red dots are showing the uh, correct and incorrect trials uh, respectively. So the uh, trial by trial estimation of the observer's psychometric function is based on the observer's response to the optimal stimulus intensity that is uh, computed by the, uh, the Psi method algorithm to maximize the information gain at the, um, at the next trial. So the, uh, the top right panel will show you the trial by trial estimation of the slope parameter of the same psychometric function with red dots. Again, the true slope parameter to be estimated is shown as the horizontal line here. Um, the bottom right panel shows you the uh, true psychometric function to be estimated by the Psi method, uh, which is represented by the blue one. And it also shows you the uh, the trial by trial estimation of the psychometric function um, in broken red curve. So the bottom panel, bottom left panel, um, here, right, um, show you how quickly the posterior probability distribution of two-dimensional psychometric, fu uh, psychometric function parameter space emerges and converges somewhere uh, from the flat prior. So um, you can probably see that the, um, the estimation of the Psi method converges to the true location parameter and true slope parameter. And you can see that this um, estimation of the psychometric function is actually closing in to the, um, the true psychometric function after 300 trials.